Hi, everybody. Welcome to the virtual Dickens Universe. My name is Renee Fox, and I am the co-director of the Dickens Project. And on behalf of John Jordan, who is our director, and Murray Baumgarten, who is our founding director, I'm so excited to be able to have you here for the third session of our, of our week-long conference. Um, just a few reminders. So um, the first is that the session is being recorded. And the second is that we have closed captioning available. So if you um, want to be able to use that, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see, um, you'll see one of the icons is a closed caption icon. If you click on that, um, you'll have the option to show closed captioning. And if you click on the show closed captioning option, um, then subtitles will appear on your screen and you'll be able to, to read them. Um, Many of you have been here with us all week or have been with us in the past for the Dickens universe, but for those of you who are, who are new to this, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about the Dickens Project. So we are a research consortium that's based at Santa Cruz, um, although we have members, um, universities and participant members from all over, the, all over the world. And every summer for the last 40 years, we've held a conference called the Dickens Universe here on the Santa Cruz campus. Um, and this conference brings together university faculty members and graduate students and high school teachers and undergraduates and literature lovers from all walks of life. We spend a week reading together and going to talks and seminars and drinking a lot of tea at Victorian teas and having Victorian dances. And the thing that makes the Dickens universe really especially unique is that every year we choose one book or two books that we all read together. And most years, although not every year, at least one of these books is a Dickens novel. And all of the activities of the universe um, are, are focused on whatever novel or novels we're reading for the week. And we use this novel or these two novels to think about the 19th century more largely and also to think about the world that we live in. So it's this really wonderful communal experience because we're all reading the same thing and we're all talking about things that we have read carefully and read attentively. Um, so it's a really special experience. Sadly, this year we can't all be doing this on the Santa Cruz campus together, but very, very happily we can be doing it here in this virtual space and we have just a wonderful set of speakers today who are going to be talking about Harper Studies in 2020. Now, quickly, just before I turn it over to Bridget Fielder, who's going to be um, introducing our speakers, I wanted to say a few things. First, I just wanted to offer a huge thank you to the, to the people who've organized our program for this week, Ryan Fong, Jason Rudy, Trisha Lutens, and Bridget Fielder. They put together just an amazing set of panels, and we are so grateful to them. I also want to offer a huge thank you to Courtney Mahaney, who has been working absolutely tirely, tirelessly behind the scenes to make sure that all of these sessions have been coming off um, so beautifully um, technologically and you know, working behind the scenes to make sure that anybody with connectivity problems is, is able to log in and just you know, organizing everything. So she just has the hugest, hugest thanks I can possibly offer. Um, for these sessions, we're going to be using the Q&A function in order to both ask questions of our panelists and serve as a kind of um, board for comments and interactions between attendees. So feel free to use the Q&A function. You'll see it. It's right next to the closed captioning function on the bottom of your screen. Um, so ask any questions you have. We'll be monitoring the questions and, um, and at the end. Um, there will be about 15 or 20 minutes of Q&A um, uh, aimed at our panelists. Um, oh, right. Last thing I, I wanted to remind you just before we, we turn things over. Tomorrow's session is at 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 2.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. So it's an hour and a half later than the other sessions. I'm going to remind you of that again at the end, but I thought it's a good thing to, to maybe remind you uh, to remind you twice. So, um, oh, and one last thing. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to a short statement of community guidelines on language, hate speech, and appropriate terminology um, that is going to be, um, a link to that is going to be shared with you in the, in the chat. Um, so um, I encourage you to, uh, to click on that and to read that and to use that as a guideline for the way that we 
want to in, be interacting with each other during this session and during all of the sessions for this week. So without further ado, I would like to turn this over to Bridget Fielder and our panelists and, um, and I'm looking forward to a really wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you so much, Renee. Um, thanks so much to the organizers, uh, Jason, Ryan, and Tricia, uh, for the opportunity to have this conversation um, with these scholars who I've learned so much from over uh, the course of many years. So I just want to introduce them briefly before we get to our conversation. Uh, Caritha Mitchell is an associate professor of English at The Ohio State University, and she is the author of Living with Lynching, um, and the, you will recognize her Broadview edition of Iola Leroy is likely the one that you're reading if you're reading Iola Leroy right now. Um, she's also author of the forthcoming much anticipated book From Slave Cabins to the White House. Derek Spires is an associate professor of English at Cornell University. He is the author of the Practice of Citizenship, um, Black Politics and Print Culture in the Early United States. Um, and he's also a general editor of the Broadview Anthology of uh, American Literature that's forthcoming. And Nazira Sadiq Wright is an associate professor of English and African American and Africana Studies at the University of Kentucky. She is the author of Black Girlhood in the 19th Century. Um, she is the creator of a digital humanities project, Digital Girls, Mapping Black Girlhood in, in the 19th Century. And her working on a second book um, on early African American women writers and their libraries. Um, and I am Bridget Fielder. I am an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And my book, um, uh, Relative Races Genealogies of Interracial Kinship in 19th Century America, is forthcoming uh, from Duke University Press in October. And I'm the co editor of Against a Sharp White Background Infrastructures of African American Print with Jonathan Stenchen. So thank you all. Thank you all for coming um, and uh, entering into this conversation with me. Um, I very much wanted to have this conversation with scholars um, in African American studies, uh, early African American studies uh, about Harper um, because they are brilliant people from whom I have always learned a lot but also I wanna emphasize that um, these are colleagues who are models of colleagueship and mentorship um, and ethical practices of colleagueship and mentorship that I think are really foundational to the most interesting work that's being done um, in American studies right now. Um, and I'm always learning from them uh, in a, a wide variety of ways. And so, uh, I, I wanted to just kind of start out our conversation by, um, you know, situating us um, as, uh, you know, mid-career scholars at a particular moment of 19th century African American literary studies um, and to think a little bit about what our uh, journeys are to this place. And so I wanted to just begin um, by asking uh, if you might talk a little bit about uh, each of your um, introductions to 19th century African American literature um, and to Francis Harper in particular um, to kind of show us what brought you to this particular specialization. I guess I'll get us started. Thank you so much for organizing us and thank you to the Dickens universe. I want to follow the excellent example of uh, Jennifer Brody from her earlier presentation by letting you know that I use she, her pronouns. And I'm coming to you from central Ohio, which is the unceded land of the Shawnee Nation. Uh, and I say unceded largely because uh, having studied this book, <laughs> I understand that uh, the battle was quite fierce. So in terms of my being introduced to 19th century African American literature and Harper in particular, it really began for me at the University of Maryland College Park in a class, a graduate class with Carla Peterson. Uh, it was 19th century American women writers. And I know for sure that we read um, Iola Leroy, but in conjunction with 
uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Charlotte Temple, uh, and other uh, important works of 19th century U.S. women. The kind of pivotal part of that experience, I think, for me, is because I was at the University of Maryland, uh, you know, there were certain scholars who came through who were very invested in 19th century African American literature, including Gabrielle Foreman, who came through in the years that I was there, John Ernest, who came through. Um, and at the end of my time at Maryland, Mary Helen Washington was uh, kind enough to write a letter of recommendation for a Ford Foundation uh, fellowship. So that absolutely changed my life and is a big part of why I'm a scholar at all. <laughs> so I would say that um, when I think of Iola Lee Roy, that is the initial kind of cluster of scholars who made it such an impactful text for me. And I can jump in right now. Um, I was first introduced to 19th century African American lit um, as an undergraduate, actually, at the University of Virginia. Um, I took classes with Dr. Deborah McDowell at UVA, um, and I learned a lot from her. I went on to Howard University for my master's degree, and um, I took courses in 20th century African American literature as well as 18th and 19th. Um, and when I entered the doctoral program, also at the University of Maryland at College Park, um, I was interested in coming of age novels, um, particularly in the 20th and in the 20th century, actually. I was interested in looking at the black girl figure in 20th century African American literature. Um, however, when I took Carla Peterson's class um, at the University of Maryland, I learned more about representations of Black girls in early African American literature. And I was, I really gravitated towards Frances Harper's text in particular. Um, I, um, I'm very interested in one of her serialized novels called Trial and Triumph. Um, in that novel, there is one of the first dark-skinned Black girls um, in the canon. And so, um, so I wrote a seminar paper on trial and triumph, and that seminar paper eventually transformed into one of the third chapter in my book. Um, and so, so yes, I I originally was going to going to learn about 20th century African American literature coming of age text, but um, after taking courses at Maryland um, with Carla Peterson and with Mary Helen Washington. Um, both of whom were my dissertation directors, I, I really gravitated towards Harper. Yeah, so you're going to get a running theme, Carl <laughs> Peterson, <laughs> ties us all together. But um, I graduated from an HBCU, Tougaloo College for undergrad. Um, and my introduction to African American Lit class there um, was the sort that you typically see, which is a beginnings to whenever sort of setup where um, typically you get Wheatley um, introduction to oral culture, Douglas, Jacobs, and then we're off to Harlem Renaissance. Um, and so that was my introduction to African American literature, and that was a pattern um, until graduate school at least. The irony is that I can't remember being assigned. Harper in any class from undergrad through graduate school. Um, so my first proper introduction to her writing didn't come until I was in, at the exam stage and reading the Anglo-African magazine. I knew who Harper was, um, but I hadn't really spent time sitting with her work. And that, I think, introduction is different because I was encountering her sort of middle of the century it wasn't through Iola Leroy or her poetry, it was through a prose, so the two offers and the Fancy Sketches series in the context of all these other people. And from my um, perspective, I was thinking, who is this like, funny person? Like she, had, she has had this sharp wit in the prose that I was instantly hooked on. Um, 
and tried to find everything out, everything I could about her work and her legacy. And one of the key people I read at that point was Carla Peterson's work on fancy sketches, um, but also um, Gabrielle Foreman's work. Um, so I didn't have a chance to take courses with, with these people, but their work was there and they were my guide in the Harper land. And um, Harper like became increasingly, especially after graduate school, um, a lens for reading the rest of the 19th century because there's kind of a Harper for every moment, a Harper for every movement, a Harper for every genre. It's, there's a Harper for everything. And so no matter what I was trying to get my hand on in the 19th century, Harper was in it in a way that just made her always present. Uh, I love this. Derek always tells us that there's a Harper for every season and it's so, so true. Um, uh, so I went to a tiny, predominantly white slack uh, as an undergraduate and did a number of vaguely literary things before uh, settling on literature. I did not major in literature as an undergraduate um, or in my first master's program, but always worked on 19th century literature uh, in one way or another, writing um, theses on Russian lit 19th century literature and French 19th century literature. And for a while, I thought I wanted to be a Victorianist. But um, I first read Black literature in uh, an assigned class um, only after I got to my second master's degree program at Syracuse University with Amy Lang, um, uh, who taught both Harriet Wilson's Our Nig and Harriet Jacobs' Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl um, in uh, one of the first seminars that I took with her. Uh, and when I got to Cornell, uh, working with Shirley Samuels, The Study of American Women Writers, um, was, uh, you know, women were just part of the canon in a way that I had not really understood before. And um, being able to, uh, you know, center women writers um, led me pretty clearly straight to Harper. And I first read Iola Leroy um, in, a, in a class with Shirley, I, I think. And so um, from there, um, thinking about 19th century uh, African American literature. Um, just kind of crept more and more and more into the work that I was doing, um, uh, where I, uh, you know, centered on American U.S. 19th century studies, um, and then kind of settled um, a, a little bit more clearly into African American literary studies, um, in large part because of the, the the deep, deep breadth of that work, and Harper is part of that. Um, I think of her a lot with my teaching because I always teach Harper and I always teach Harper in multiple genres because it's hard um, to choose uh, just one thing um, when there's so much in such a diverse array uh, of work um, that one can, can bring in. And so um, I guess one of the things that I'd like to ask you all too is like, how then do you think about Harper in, uh, in your own teaching? Um, and maybe why do you think um, I know that most of us teach early African American literary uh, literature um, in ways that are really kind of constantly and consistently making connections both to the specific um, uh, historical context of those literatures and to trace those threads back to the present. Um, and so I'm wondering um, what you find most useful about Harper specifically um, when teaching um, in the 21st century. I think one of the things that Harper got and did well then that my students really understand more now is uh, leveraging multiple platforms. So we talk about it in terms of genre, poetry, um, short fiction, long fiction, newspapers, speeches, etc. Um, framing it to my students, it's if Harper were around, she'd be on Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook maybe, um, but she would be leveraging all of the platforms all the time, um, telling similar stories, but in different forms and genres. And so when I teach Harper, I'm always getting them to look at um, the way she talks about the Moses figure, for instance, in the long Moses poem, but then the way that Moses crops up as a trope and a figure 
in something like Mini Sacrifice or Iola Leroy, but then also how she uses Moses again in a speech, sort of a master of multimedia, multimodal communication. It's especially effective in, of course, like a first year writing seminar where I'm really trying to get students to think about um, audience expectations, the rhetorical situation, and how to think about how to leverage platforms. Um, and I find Harper just infinitely fascinating too, because um, like my students seem to hunger for what she says and how she says it. Like you read something like Our Greatest Want or um, her speeches during Reconstruction in particular on women's rights. And the conversation quickly turns without my necessarily having to, having to say, how does this relate to the 21st century, right? I'm teaching Harper during Supreme Court nominee confirmation hearings where students are seeing this stuff getting enacted in real time and say, hey, that's kind of like that congressperson who said X, Y, Z, or that's kind of like this senator who's kind of a feminist, but she's a white feminist. Harper talks about them. Um, and so it and it rolls from there. And so it doesn't take, at least from my perspective, a ton of effort on my part to get students to begin making the connections. It's present Harper well framed in her sort of fullness um, without reducing her to any one kind of moment of mo movement or mode and then letting them play. Um. Yes, um, in addition to what Derek just said, I also think Harper is timeless. Um, when I teach Harper, I, um, I'm able to cover a lot of ground about what is happening among African-American families in the 19th century. Um, and, and what is happening is still, some of the issues are still occurring in Black families today, which is why her work is so timeless to me. I mean, Harper, teaches students about, um, teaches her readers about parenting within Black families, about institution building, um, about school and education. Um, in one of her novels there, in one of her serialized novels, there's a girl who's a valedictorian um, and she's grappling um, between whether she should get married or whether she should um, continue her career as a teacher. Um, and students really relate to the messages in her text because some of the issues that Harper instructs um, are still some of the issues that Black families are grappling with now. Um, um, but also, I, I like teaching Harper because she, she has a message also for almost every decade of the 19th century. Like, I teach the two offers um, and that focuses on the 1850s, um, each of her serialized novels. Um, you can talk about what is occurring among Black families in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. Like She has a work for every decade in the 19th century. Um, and so I'm able to, to talk about what is happening in the 19th century through teaching um, one of her serialized novels or even two of them and short stories and speeches. Um, I think that her work is, um, is timeless in that regard and also um, expresses ideas about um, what is happening on a, on a very intimate level among Black families as well. Conversations that are happening within homes, I think, are just as important um, that, uh, just as important as conversations that are happening at a national and political level. And I will admit that um, Iola Leroy is without question my favorite. So I think I'm a little bit more narrow probably than Nazira and Derek. And honestly, in following their rich careers, I already knew I was a little bit more narrow. <laughs> um, but you know, what, what I'll admit is that you know, part of what I find so powerful about Iola Leroy is that it allows me to deal with uh, you know, antebellum period, civil war, emancipation, post-emancipation, and covering that kind of ground I find to be useful in literally any U.S. literature course. Um, I think the other thing, though, that teaching Iola Leroy always does for me is it allows me to really 
grapple with how much our education system has encouraged um, a kind of being at a loss, like, oh, I have no idea how we could have this racist nation when there were just so many good, progressive, courageous white people like Abraham Lincoln. I mean, how did we end up with Trump? And so to me, using Iola Leroy is a way for us to really grapple with how have we been given this history and how is it that one stance that could be taken, the stance of, you know, the only way that this could happen is because Black people have somehow not done something right, because look at all the good white people have done all of these things right. That kind of foundation that all of my students walk into the classroom with is something that I use Iola Leroy to make explicit. So I had been teaching that novel with Hazel Carby's edition um, you know, Deborah McDowell, of course, created the Black Women Writers series for Beacon, and that's the edition that I had been using for the past, you know, 15 years of my career um, to teach Iola Leroy. And so part of what I got invested in doing was to really highlight what are these discourses that Harper gives us in a text that actually challenges the discourse, right? And, and Bridget, you've really helped me see just how much she does that, right? So for example, when we're looking at Eugene Leroy, you've kind of highlighted the way that he's not that impressive. And Harper gave us the tools for understanding how not impressive he is even in the moment. So I think for me, that's the reason why teaching Iola Leroy is so useful because it allows us to step back and figure out what are some of these discourses and practices that have shaped our nation and that we haven't noticed is a dominant discourse that needs to be questioned. And Iola Leroy lets me do that. I think this gets to a really, really important point um, for me about Harper um, and uh, early African American women writers in particular, maybe more broadly, the, the larger community with, with whom she is, you know, conversing is that um, Black women in the 19th century are already making many Black feminist points that need to be reiterated decade after decade after decade after decade. And um, in, in exactly what uh, you talk about, Caritha, um, Harper's critique of white progressives is so on point and also so uh, useful for thinking about the present. Um, and this is in, you know, Iola Leroy, it's in Minnie's Sacrifice, um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, in her speeches, definitely, um, to uh, white women suffrage organizations that are falling apart. Um, and uh, she really allows us to get to the problem of um, silencing Black women in a literary canon. And so you can use Harper's work herself to teach um, the problem with which you have to kind of introduce uh, students new to African American literature or new to early African American literature, which is, I know you've never heard of this person before I put her on my syllabus today. Um, you know, I, I'm going to talk to you about why, um, you know, what structural failings <laughs> that are not individual failings that have brought you to a place where you've never heard of Frances Harper until you get into this room. Um, and uh, how a lot of the kind of early critique of Harper um, was really, you know, full of the same kind of misogynoir that she herself spoke out against, right? And so you can see this in a lot of early work on, on African American literature, asking, you know, these absolutely inane questions about whether her work is any good or whether it's really literature that, like, people should be reading. And, like, um, well, you know, Black people read this literature and they talked about it. And there are entire genres um, that are misconstrued when you leave out the work of African American women writers and I you know I, I've been thinking about this you know quite a bit with something like mixed race heroin fiction who I first came to through William Wallace Brown love him though I do um if that's the only book you read you have uh, uh, William Wallace Brown's Clotel then you have no idea what mixed race heroin fiction is doing in the century because it's doing something much more complex and and broad um from the 18th century through <laughs> into the 20th um, than what this kind of narrow focus on even, you know, excluding women from the African-American literary, early African-American literary canon um, 
does. And once you start to read Harper and you start to see all the other women writers that she's in conversation with and, uh, and you know, those larger threads that she's pulling through her work um, that are indicative of these larger cultures, then you can see how I think she herself is kind of very aware of, you know, she, she can anticipate some of these critiques, uh, right? And she responds to them in real time. Um, and when you read a book like Iola Leroy, you can kind of see that happening. Um, and it makes for a kind of great meta commentary, right? With, uh, you know, with students, even who are new to these conversations. And could I add just really quickly, um, you're also making me think about one moment that's been powerful in the classroom for me is seeing a uh, student's response to her poem about Margaret Garner, because they come to the classroom with some awareness from Toni Morrison's beloved, and then to, you know, especially because I'm in Ohio, to make that connection to Harper, you know, thinking through Margaret Garner has been another powerful uh, pedagogical moment. This is yeah. a slave mother, the tale of the Ohio, right? Um, yeah. E exactly. Yeah, I would suggest about to um, say a slave mother tale of Ohio is one of my greatest hits to teach when I teach the early American survey, which when I taught it ran from beginnings, whenever that is to I think 1865, sometimes past the Civil War. And so I have a very small amount of time and I'd spend two sessions on Harper in the kind of romanticism piece part of the course talking about sentimentalism. And I have them read Harper's A Slave Mother, the first one from 1854 that begins with the sort of question, heard you that shriek, it rose. Um, really pointing the finger at readers and getting them, not asking legitimately, did you hear that? But incredulously, you heard that, right? And then I go from there to A Slave Mother to Ohio because it has the Margaret Garner connection. And then we can talk about how Harper even in that short span, so it evolves her own aesthetic. And she talks about the evolution because in Frances Smith Foster's collection, there's a letter she writes to William Steele where she's like, yeah, I read 12 Years a Slave and that narrative rocked my world. Like I can read Stowe and she uses this phrase where she says, Stowe clothes enslavement with the beautiful, gar the graceful garb of fiction. This is Harper giving a literary critical take on Stowe's practice of sentimentalism. And so in that just sort of two day, three text swing, can use Harper to introduce the ballad, the poetry, use Harper to introduce mid 19th century aesthetic theory because that's what she's doing. You can use that third poem to make the connection to 20th, 21st century literary considerations about around Margaret Garner and dealing with horror and affect and sort of rebellion because she praises Margaret Garner as a hero, this woman who sort of kills her daughter rather than see her re-enslaved, right? She's holding her up. So how does Harper take this form, which when I was taking um, the lit surveys, writers who wrote in the ballad, 19th century writers who wrote ballads were poo-poo, right? That's not, it's not radical, it's sort of popular, popular. Um, but you read Harper in context and really think about what she's doing with those modes, right? And it cracks everything else open. And then you go to someone like Emerson and students are sort of like, <sighs> sorry. Uh, but uh, thinking back to the conversation yesterday, centering Harper as the entree into these discussions rather than centering Emerson and then tacking Harper on as the kind of add on. Okay, now we're going to talk about like the lone black woman and slavery for 20 minutes and then we're going to go. Instead, we send a Harper. Emerson has to take a bit of a back seat, but I'm okay with that. Another um, pedagogical moment that I use when teaching Harper is to talk about the Christian reporter. Um, the black newspaper in which Harper serialized um, her three novels. Um, and I also talk about another black magazine called the Repository of Religion and Literature and of Science and Art where she published um, some of her poems. Um, and so um, when I teach Harper, I 
I talk to students about serialization. I talk to students about the early black press, um, specifically the Christian Reporter. And I also um, have students read articles published in the Christian Recorder that were published alongside the chapters that, that were, um, came out every, um, every two weeks when Harper's chapters were published so that students could understand what else was being published at the same time Harper's um, chapters were being published in the Christian Recorder. Um, um, there are parenting articles in the Christian Recorder, articles about black girlhood, um, articles about um, extended families caring for children because biological parents were, were not there. And so, and so a lot of these themes exist in Harper's serialized novels. We can, we can really understand um, what is happening during any political moment in the 19th century by looking at the black press. Um, and so students gain a, a great understanding of, of not only Harper and, and, and the kind of publishing restraints that she had because perhaps the Christian Reporter was the only outlet available to her to publish her serialized novels, but also understanding um, what was happening politically, economically, socially among black families um, in, in, the 19, in the 1860s, in the 1870s, even in the 1880s when the Christian Reporter was being published. So students really like looking at the articles, um, they, um, it, becomes, it becomes very real to them when they're reading Harper alongside articles that are, that are talking about current political issues um, in every decade that the, the newspaper was being published. I'll second, um, you know, teaching Harper's uh, alongside um, periodical seriality um, and print culture. Um, this is something that I've come to really, really love, love doing, um, and uh, the mechanisms for doing this have changed significantly. Trying to do this online, I usually take students to the archives and look at actual newspapers um, and, just, and just read a newspaper and see what's there. Um, but, uh, you know, to shift to do that digitally um, with, uh, you know, a, a, a newspaper like the Christian Reporter, um, or other earlier um, things that she's, you know, serialized her first, uh, some of her short fiction um, in the Anglo-African magazine, um, allow students to get a sense of what other stuff, um, they, they, they get a sense of historical contextualization um, when they understand the conditions under which people are reading this and what they're reading this alongside and what things are happening in the world. Um, you know, they, they get a sense of conversations between people in those texts, yes. um, uh, in longer generic threads, um, they 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 come to understand genre better, I think, in in, in a lot of ways. If you think uh, um, in that larger uh, context for sharing things, like if you read *Mini Sacrifice* next to Julia Collins' *The Curse of Cast*, yes. then you think differently about like you know what these authors' um, relationship to one another is um, in this print space. Um, and I think that really helps students to understand um, issues of categorization and relation mm -hmm. um, in ways that I've found otherwise a little bit different, difficult to teach students um, who are just being introduced to a larger body of work, right? They're just being thrown into this in the middle of a conversation. Um, how do we orient them to the conversation? Um, that's you know one I think really great activity that, uh, that that allows us to do that and Harper is very much part of that conversation um, and so her work really kind of I think illustrates a lot of those connections. Absolutely. Um, what, one of the questions I wanted to ask you all too, when you've um, you know started to get at this uh, a bit, is um, uh, to think about. Um, the foundational work that has been done on Harper to this point that has allowed you to do the work that you that you're doing in the classroom and in your own writing um, but also I'd love to hear a, a, a bit about um, challenges working with Harper right now um, and uh, what some of the, the the biggest difficulties you see or maybe the the, the, the biggest potential you see um, for uh, developments in Harper Studies scholarship um, or teaching going forward? Mm -hmm. 
Teresa, you're muted, sorry. Oh, okay. Am I unmuted now? Oh, thank you, sorry. Um, and I'll try to be brief. I mean, you know, one of the things that of course has been foundational is all of the amazing work done by Francis Smith Foster, uh, Mary Emma Graham, Melba Boyd, um, as well as Eric Gardner, like all of the, all of these really senior scholars who have done kind of the most meticulous archival work really laid a remarkable foundation. And I think part of what allowed me to move from kind of being content <laughs> with the addition of Viola Leroy that, that existed to moving forward to edit one myself was that moment, um, you know, that involved, I think, Bridget and um, Alex Black and Eric Gardner and Carla Peterson. Like there was this huge um, round table that was printed about um, forest leaves when the um, extant copy was found. And so I think that it was sort of the the combination of that amazing foundation that had been laid for decades and decades and then added to that what digital publication allowed in um, you know that recovered um, poetry collection that kind of intersection of a strong foundation that allowed us to build on and then innovations with digital uh, media I think is what makes this moment so rich and exciting. And so, you know, I continue to be just kind of amazed by conversations I'm privy to. Uh, for example, when we were at the Civil War Caucus and Derek Spires was talking about all of the history of the book kinds of things that he's a part of. So I think that I just am eager to watch some of the developments that are coming. <laughs> like I don't, I, I haven't found myself nearly as frustrated, I think, because I've been a little bit more, um, I haven't been as broad in my exploration as like Derek has been. So I think for me, I'm just excited to continue to watch what other people are doing uh, and then move on from, from there to kind of broaden myself. I can go next. Um, foundational scholars that have influenced me are Carla Peterson, Gabrielle Foreman, Eric Gardner, um, especially Francis Smith Foster. Um, I'm very, I'm very excited about where Harper Studies is going and and new exciting developments in the field. Um, for example, I'm I'm currently working on a book chapter on Francis Harper's involvement with Philadelphia's Mercantile Library. Um, and, and the only way I gain entry into this chapter is, is through an article that Eric Gardner wrote about um, ensuring that scholars of early African-American literature read the acknowledgments um, in, that are printed in Black newspapers. Um, and so I, I was studying Mrs. N. F. Moselle's um, newspaper column in the New York Age. Um, her name is Gertrude Bustill Moselle. She wrote an advice column in the New York Age. Um, and she has a list of people that she acknowledges before each advice column. And so I went back to read the acknowledgments and I see that she thanks Frances Harper um, for loaning her her library ticket to the Mercantile Library. And, that access to the Mercantile Library helped Moselle write the content of that particular advice column. Um, and so this, this one clue by reading the acknowledgments um, and seeing Harper's name made me think about what is Harper's relationship to, the, to Philadelphia's Mer Mercantile Library. And, and it opened up a whole, a whole new um, vein of research for me. Um, I learned that Philadelphia's Mercantile Library was established in 1821. Um, it closed its doors in 1989 when the Free Library of Philadelphia absorbed its records. Um, and I contacted Eric Gardner actually to ask him, how do I, how do I find um, evidence that Francis Harper actually held a membership? Like what kind of, how do I, how do I look through those records? Because um, 
the records I learned were unprocessed records. The Mercantile Library records were unprocessed and they were held in a vault. Um, so I gained access to the vault. I read through membership books. I read through um, the history of the Mercantile Library to try to find um, a black presence in these records. Um, and so the Mercantile Library was a library that was designed for the social climbing of white men. And, and here's Harper who has um, a membership to this library and she loaned her, her library ticket to another black woman writer. Um, and, so, and so the significance of this is profound. It shows that these two black women writers knew each other in Philadelphia on an intimate level. Um, the relationship shows that Harper and Moselle were instructing their readers that they have, they should go to these institutions to find, um, to find research for their own books, um, teaching their readers how to, how to seek out information. Um, the relationship shows that access to these resources is, is, should be available to all black women. Um, and so, and so I'm very interested in, and how this, these types of print sources, the acknowledgement can help widen the field of, um, of Harper studies. Um, and one more, one more example is that I saw an endorsement that Frances Harper gave to another black women writer. Her name is um, Rebecca Crumpler. She's actually the first black woman to earn a medical degree. Um, she's one of the first black doctors in the US and she wrote a book called um, Racial Discourses um, in 1883 and Harper endorsed her book. Um, and this endorsement occurred in 1882. And so, so, so I'm finding traces of Harper um, in other types of arenas. And, and what I want, to, want readers and scholars to learn from this is that there are other genres that we should that we should look at um, the genres of the endorsement, the genre of the advertisement, or or the acknowledgement, um, so that so that we can kind of widen our understanding of nineteenth century um, African American literary studies by moving beyond the bound book, by looking at other types of print sources to learn even more about Frances Harper because her her reach was so wide, um, and she influenced a lot of Black women scholars and writers. Um, um, during her existence, yes. So I'm excited for Nazira's work to come out. <laughs> Just gonna start with that. Um, people who are foundational to me, in addition to the folks we've already named, um, Gabrielle Foreman and Michael Stancliffe's work, um, Martha Jones's work, um, and also in terms of how to approach someone like Harper who doesn't necessarily have a kind of treatise on aesthetics, but is a deep aesthetic thinker. Barbara Christian's race for theory is always in the back of my mind because she teaches us how to like look at the novel or the poem as producing its own aesthetic theory, its own heuristic, its own guide to reading. Um, I think we've talked a lot about the people who taught us and like their work is sort of about to be returned with kind of compound interest because we've all gone out and we're teaching Harper in our undergraduate and graduate seminars and talking about her at conferences and at the Dickens Universe. And so I'm looking forward to seeing the dissertation chapters that are going to be coming down the pike pretty soon. Looking forward to the folks who are working in um, Black DH um, who are doing things that I couldn't imagine because when I was in graduate school, like as I was as I would finish researching a thing, that thing would suddenly be available online, either paywalled or free. And so I'm like, why couldn't this have been available just a month ago? Um, so all of that is what makes me excited. I'm also excited by some of the challenges Harper presents. Um, Infrastructure wise, for instance, it, we really do need something like uh, a Harper Hub. Um, her poems, so many and in various forms and in various places. Um, I think it's also challenging to work on Harper because she's so intellectually eclectic. 
to understand one Harper poem might require you to think about Afro-Protestantism, um, British and American Romanticism, because she's reading deeply in both uh, pools. Um, I spent, I sank a summer trying to understand the beautiful and sublime because of Harper and the way she used those two modes of thinking. And so there's so much, and I think we have to, the thing that I have to remind myself and the thing that I look at Caritha and say, yeah, that's what I need to do. Pick my spot for a time and stick with that spot for a while because otherwise Harper will have your head spinning because she does so much. Um, it's such a long life. So, yeah. I wanna reiterate um, some of wh what I gestured at earlier along the lines of what you all are talking about in that, um, you know, the kind of model that I think, I think somebody like Harper gives us for collaborative collective work is also the model that we need to use to study her. And so when you see foundational work um, that has basically just made Harper available for our, um, you know, reading consumption uh, more widely by people like Frances Smith Foster, people who have, you know, helped us to see, um, you know, Harper's, uh, you know, um, breadth uh, and span in other places um, has also uh, come with a, a particular kind of scholarly generosity um, that I don't think I see in every single corner of academia, but that I definitely see in early African American literary studies. Um, and that means that people are willing to share information. <laughs> um, people are willing to, you know, pass on work that they've been doing. I've been, you know, in a position where I didn't have access to the Christian Recorder digitally, and so I had to like write to Eric Gardner and ask him, like, what was there? Uh, and so um, the the willingness of people to think and work collaboratively, I think, um, is a, a boon of the field, and that's something that is really coming together around Harper studies. I think in ways um, where people have been in conversation about um, all of this excitement. Um, the absolutely overwhelming amount of work that could still be done on Harper and um, to think about strategies for how to make that work happen in, you know, kind of collective um, co uh, and um, strategic formations um, of colleagueship with one another. Um, and, and I think that's, um, you know, something that's been really exciting for me to see as people talk about Harper um, work that they're doing, um, you know, they're also talking to other people about stuff that they may or may not have access to, stuff that they haven't yet thought about. Um, you know, there's always some other part of this that you don't see. Um, and it's hard to see all parts of a, of a scholar with this breadth um, at once. Um, and so I think that approach is, is really kind of necessary for us, but also feeds into the kinds of um, colleagueship that I, that I think um, you know, many folk in this field are also trying to form, and that's been really, really nice, uh, I think, for thinking about the future and the support of junior scholars in particular. Uh, do any of you have a last uh, comment or question before we open to the Q&A, because we're getting up to towards uh, the hour. I just want to say one, one point um, to build on what you just said about um, about collaboration and sharing. Um, I, th I think that's the, that's the only way to help build the field as well um, and to help the field grow. I'm, I'm always in the archives. I, I always find interesting material and there isn't any way I could publish all of it. And so, so naturally I, um, I share what I find with other, with other junior scholars because my point and my intention is that I want this work to be published. I want other scholars to have access to it. And if I hold on to what I find, then while I'm working on my second book, then this, this interesting piece from the archives will, will have to be put on hold for two, three, four more years. Um, and, so, and, so for, and so I do agree with um, sharing, sharing, collaborating, um, um, you know, not holding on to work um, so that the field grows um, and so and and so that early African American literature grows and so that and items in the archive that we may locate 
it can be put into print and, and contextualized. Um, and so I, I, yes, I believe wholeheartedly in that. Okay, I think I'll invite Ryan Fong back and um, let's open it up for the Q&A portion. Hi, everyone. Um, that was just an amazing, inspiring conversation. And thank you so much. Um, um, I was furiously taking notes in addition to my duties of monitoring the Q&A. This is just fascinating. Um, the first thing that I want to do, just to make sure that you all see this uh, or, or note it, is that um, Carla Peterson is here listening in. Um, and she says that she's very happy to be a student today um, and learn so much from her former students. So um, I think uh, this, this wonderful generous model of, of intergenerational scholarship um, that you all have been modeling, I think it's is just been really, uh, really great. Um, in terms, uh, I also wanted to just um, kind of uplift, uh, um, some folks were talking about um, trying to access different resources and they were sharing that in the, the Q&A. Um, I just wanted to point folks to the list of selected reading lists, uh, selected readings um, of Harper that Bridget put together for this conference that's on the Dickens Project um, website um, that has links to electronically available uh, text from Harper. So um, seeing a lot of interest of people wanting to go read more Harper, which is fa fabulous. Um, so I don't it's know if Bridget, you want to say. It's a very small selection. It's just a very, very small selection, but it is available to read online. So. <laughs> Yep, so I think um, we have a lot of people who are really excited to not only dive into Isla Leroy, but, um, but more Harper, which is fantastic. Um, so the first question that I'm wondering if you, if you all can speak to, um, this is from uh, Cabria. Um, so if, if, could you speak about Harper's activism um, a little bit more? And um, particularly her work as an anti-slavery activist and lecturer in Maine, but also as a teacher in, in Union Seminary in Ohio. Um, how did her activism inform and connect with, with her literary sensibilities? Um, I think just as a start, when you read Harper, you're reading someone who's clearly engaged in how pedagogy works. Um, and so she's she has a deep investment in literature as something one can and should enjoy, but also in literature that one that should also teach um, moral lessons through example um, and through sort of as a kind of thought experience. So she has character, she has dialogue that walks you through these processes um, and that this work should be accessible back to one of the terms that came up towards the end of our conversation. So she talks um, in several places about um, what kinds of things we should be reading to children. Uh, we should be telling our children about Margaret Garner. We should be telling our children about um, slave rebels, Zumbi, Dos Palmares, the Brazilian Colombo, um, the 17th century. And, um, and so all of that is sort of that training, that pedagogical training from her uncle to William Watkins back in Maryland, all of that um, gets manifested in the way she approaches her craft and the way that she travels. The question notes that, well, she starts in Maryland, she tries Pennsylvania, then she ends up in Maine, and then she ends up back, and then Ohio. Those travels in a way that is similar to Zora Neale Hurston deepens her sort of artistic cultural toolkit. And so I think all of that work also gives her the kind of linguistic rhetorical flexibility um, with her work. I'll add that, I mean, I definitely have always thought of her in terms of activism. There are two things that the question raises for me. Number one, the way that I see her as such a role model in terms of uh, you know, keeping her eye on the ball of the cultural change she wants to see, regardless of the limitations of other people. So white women's racism didn't deter her, black men's sexism didn't deter her. She continued to keep her eye on the ball of how can I make this country better? And regardless of how other people hold themselves to low standards, I'm going to have my own standard for the impact that I wanna make. So as an activist, her continuing to work with white women who 
had been, um, you know, less than invested in Black people's freedom is part of how she's a role model. I would also say that, you know, because we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, I think of her as someone who was a model citizen who didn't have the vote. Uh, there's this uh, letter in which she, I believe it was, um, I'm not going to get it right. So especially on a call with all of these periodical specialists, let me just shut up. Um, <laughs> but, the, um, but basically she said something like, you know, I'm an old maid, um, you know, budding in the business of slaveholders. And that is such a perfect way to understand how much she, you know, the country said that the people whose opinions mattered were slaveholders. If you went by who had the right to vote, slaveholders had the right to vote, not her. But she's saying, I'm going to butt in the business of these people and I'm going to cultivate conversations that I have the power to cultivate to create the feeling and the ideas in the culture that will move toward universal freedom. So to my mind, this is a way in which she helps us to think dynamically about citizenship, that even without the vote, she sees herself as influencing conversations that will move the country to where she wants to see it go. I'd also add that, that Harper is in the midst of a lot of things gone wrong um, in, uh, you know, supposedly progressive struggles for social justice. Um, you know, she watched, she supports uh, and holds up, um, you know, white women abolitionists like Harriet Beecher Stowe. She's part of, you know, the suffrage movement. And then when the American Equal Rights Association falls apart over the question of whether or not um, Congress should pass the 15th Amendment, giving Black men the right to vote, um, you know, she calls it out. And, um, it, you know, and, and ultimately is able to work with which, you know, whatever white women are, um, you know, willing to have a kind of multiracial coalition of uh, of suffrage work while the big name um, you know white women are are aligning themselves literally with white supremacists um, but also and this happens in the middle of Viola Leroy um, you know she stages a conversation between a black woman and her husband about um, suffrage at, at rights um, and the problems of the 15th amendment that she's able to support and simultaneously critique um, in real time and so um, you know, she doesn't model a simple pro progress narrative in her work um, or even, uh, you know, uh, align along a progress narrative, um, but, um, you know, how to work in an absolute political mess. Uh, and, and that, I think, is really inspiring for me to read. What is, what is inspiring for me is that Harper's, Harper's serialized novel and her novel and her speeches she um, she talks about how she talks about activism at the institutional level, but she also she also talks about activism at the pre-institutional level, which is um, which I think is um, at, in a more intimate level, like within families, um, be, um, conversations between two black women, conversations between a child and her mother or her grandmother conversations among community members. Um, she, she, she shows a different stratification of class um, in, her, in her works, which shows that people of all class ranks can participate politically um, in this landscape. And she, I think she shows that eloquently through, through dialogues among people of different class stratification. I think that, I think that Harper also models um, how to, how to get involved? She she invite in the novel she and in the serialized novel she invites black women into homes, um, offers reading material to black women, um, shows black girls and black women how to read, how to understand a text. She's she's showing her activism and showing her readers how to participate um, in the political landscape um, based on where they are. Um, socially um, within their homes, within their own families. Um, and so I think that's why so many people, even when, even in the 19th century who are reading Harper's work gravitated towards her. I think that's why her work um, is, 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 
I think that's why people gravitate towards her work now because she reaches so many different class stratifications within, um, within her books. Um, and, and she models a type of activism that everyone can be involved in. Great. Um, so um, I'm going to put a couple questions together um, that I think relate. So I'm um, kind of putting together Francis Foster's question um, with Melissa Homestead. And so, I mean, think building on this, this, uh, this discussion that you've been developing around her activism and her politics, um, if you could speak a little bit to really her, and you've already been doing this in a lot of ways, but to, to kind of her aesthetic virtuosity and brilliance um, and the ways in which she she's deploying that, um, specifically in Iola Leroy. And so Melissa um, Homestead was asking kind of uh, Iola Leroy is a late work that's not serialized, kind of maybe how she's using um, a not serialized form in, in strategic ways. But if you can, since we're embarking on a year of reading Iola Leroy, if you could talk about some of the specific ways that she's manifesting this, this aesthetic virtuosity and brilliance um, in, in Iola Leroy as a novel. I'll just say quickly that part of what I try to emphasize to my students is uh, to think about the way that she's using the novel form and um, you know various voices within the novel form as part of what's so important. I encourage them to think about the way that they have come to the classroom very often thinking about literature by marginalized groups in a kind of anthropological way that it's going to reveal some insight about these strange and interesting people. Uh, and that Harper, um, you know, because she is, you know, uh, highly intertextual, right? She is um, in conversation with poetry by both Anglo-American and white British uh, authors, as well as her own poetry, incorporating some of her speeches, making sure that, again, those various voices in terms of staging um, the conversazione, all of those ways that she's really invested in different kinds of form should challenge students to think about how much she cares about craft and aesthetics. And so that's one of the things that I try to emphasize. Um, when I think about Iola Leroy, I think about genre. I think about what does the what can the novel do that a serialized novel cannot do, or why the novel and not a serialized novel, not a poem. Um, and so, so I think about um, the significance of that generic form, um, a form where someone has to first buy the book and then sit with sit with the book for an extended period of time rather than anticipating another, you know, serialized chapter that comes out every two weeks. Um, so when I when I talk about Iola Leroy versus some of her other works, I talk with my students about um, the differences between a bound book um, versus a serialized text, um, how um, the difference in reading and what that means. Um, whether there's community participation when you read a serialized novel in a newspaper versus an individual sitting at home reading the novel um, at his or her own pace. Um, and so, so those kind of questions um, arise in my classroom when I, when I talk about Iola Leroy versus her, some of her other works. I also think about genre a lot when teaching Iola Leroy um, and have been thinking uh, a lot about um, it alongside Minnie Sacrifice, her very first serialized novel that's also um, in the uh, monger mixed race heroine fiction tradition. And, and, and Harper is a real crafter of genre and reviser of genre. And um, she, uh, you know, develops this very particular generic form herself over the course of um, these two novels between 1865 and, um, uh, and 1892, three, um, with Iola Leroy, um, right. that, uh, you know, she um, really gets, I think, at um, the relationships between seriality and generic formation for me. Um, 
And I teach Isla Leroy at the end of classes rather than at the beginning, in part because I feel that it ties a lot of threads for me and for students together um, about how to, you know, kind of understand that, that kind of relationality um, between texts. Uh, and, and I think of Iola Leroy in, in some ways as um, also doing something with the serial um, in that it's not the first uh, book of its kind by far, um, but um, understanding, you know, those longer threads that Harper is pulling through the, century, the ha last half of the century really um, helps us to understand, you know, what, what's going on there. And I think some of the, you know, clear choices that she makes both aesthetically in terms of like where she ends um, and the imagery that she gives us at the end of that novel versus the imagery that she gives us at the end of Minnie's Sacrifice, which is very, very different, um, uh, as well as some of the different kinds of things that she stages within that genre of like the, you know, the speech or the dialogue, a dialectical conversation. Yeah, I like staging as a way to get at this because there's something theatrical, not in a kind of melodramatic sort of way, but in a very, like you could sit and watch Iola play out on a stage sort of way because of the way that Harper is so great with voice. Um, with all these characters coming from all these different backgrounds, class positions, regions, um, racializations, et cetera, and they each have a kind of unique voice and character development that you can track through the novel in a way that like structurally speaking, and there's, so the plot of Viola Leroy isn't funny per se, but there's a lot of humor in Viola Leroy. And I say that with two um, things in mind. One is Ralph Ellison's A Little Man at Chiha Station, where Ellison sort of restages this moment where he meets this man who's sort of working class black man at this station and he just has all these college board assumptions because the man doesn't present as he's sort of as if he's a cultural dynamo, which he is. And then the punchline is Ellison's mind gets blown. When you read Iola and um, especially for students who tend to associate dialect with the lack, lack of education, Iola is structured with the assumption that Harper's readers will, will think that about the characters. And even on the kind of page level, you can find the setup. You can find where Harper digs in and then by the end of that sort of dialogue sequence, you can see the punch where, oh, if you really pay attention, um, Gabrielle Foreman called it reading a right. If you read Iola a right, you're in on the jokes from start to finish. But it's because of Harper's understanding of voice. It's because of her understanding of structure. And I think Bridget's right that some of this comes from her work in periodicals. There's a sense of pacing, of how pacing works in structuring a narrative that she gets, I think, from all working with all of these different genres, including speeches and hearing all these different voices. There are elements of her on Chloe poems, for instance, in the way the dialogue works. So that's what I think about in terms of craft. How do you craft voices that work? How do you craft a structure that, um, that sets readers up, that makes them ride along, and then gives them a punch that if they're reading or right, they can recognize. And if they're not reading or right, and I can imagine Harper writing this and thinking, they're not going to get this bit until maybe a few years down the road. <laughs> they're not going to get this bit. Um, but maybe one day I'll plant the seed, someone else will water, and the literary culture will give the increase sort of thing. Great. Um, so um, I, this, we only really have time for one more question. Um, and this, kind of, again, well, I will hope to kind of bring a couple questions. There's, we'll be saving the Q&A, um, but there's lots of great questions that are coming up and people are excited to be teaching um, this. But um, one question that, that came up that's, um, can you talk a little bit more um, about kind of Harper's engagement with debates about strategies for black liberation and empowerment in her time? Um, and then the ways that you have 
stage that in your class with, with students um, who are thinking about contemporary movements like Black Lives Matter um, and how you've kind of helped them um, kind of think across periods in this way and make those, make those connections. Um, much in the ways that, that you were pointing out these kind of intergenerational scholarly trajectories, um, how do you help your students kind of think about these, these long trajectories of, uh, of activism that they might be a part of and that they're connecting back to, to this, this um, historical past through Harper? I can be very, very brief on this. Um, I was really struck with Jacqueline Barrio's point yesterday about the abolitionist language of our current moment and the way that that's a wonderful connection to what Harper is doing. And the thing that I'll say, one of the issues that comes up is I try to have my students think about the what we read as optimism about the reunions, the family reunions that happen in Iola Leroy, it seems so um, optimistic. And I say to them, well, if you're writing a creative work and you can create something, isn't it powerful that that's the thing that she decides to craft, that that's the thing she decides to be optimistic about? And so for me, part of what's important about that is recognizing that you know, at least I don't believe this nation is going to stop dishing out violence to me and mine. And so what can I do that isn't simply a response to that violence? How can I cultivate a sense of joy, a sense of love and nurturing that is about me and my community and the people who care about us and not simply a response to the people who hate us? I'll say something quick um, that's kind of related to this um, and has to do with um, a way that Gabrielle Foreman addresses a common reading of, a, a common misreading rather of Iola Leroy, um, which is to kind of pay too much attention to um, the characters' relationships to white men in this novel um, is to miss some of the most important things that are happening there. Um, and I think that's something that you see play out in that novel too, that it's um, that the, uh, the the radical activism doesn't simply come in, uh, you know, kind of speaking truth to power, even though that's there, but it also comes in real and difficult conversations between Black people and within Black families. Um, and that's where the work is getting done in really uh, important ways. And she lays all that out, I think, in, in that novel, um, at, in and other pieces, you know, kind of pretty clearly, but, um, you know, her work shows us that there are lots of different kinds, there's lots of different modes for this work, and they can't all just be, um, you know, the one that, that, that uh, addresses this particular point of, like, white masculine violence against Black women, um, because that's not the only thing that needs to happen. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, that when you read Harper, the work is almost always intergenerational in nature. So there are mothers talking to daughters, aunts talking to nieces, um, multiple generations of mentoring and tutoring and training. There's one in one of the fancy etchings, one of the Jenny tells her Aunt Jane, um, your life is a book. I would like to read it um, as, as a kind of pedagogical learning thing um, because Jane is has lived the life and there's a kind of respect for what has come before and a sort of hunger to know and learn from that on the younger generations and while there's a kind of generosity and giving and care that's coming from the older generations and and they're all they're all understanding that like one year five year ten year this isn't a my lifetime kind of struggle because these are one lifetime kinds of problems. They are deep institutional, infrastructural, systemic problems. And it's going to take that kind of long-range thinking. And also, like, thinking back to what Nazira said, thinking back to the really tangible, local, everyday things we can do, um, not just on a sort of activist level, but also on the, on the um, taking care of oneself level, feeding the spirit, feeding the soul. And I would just like to add quickly um, that characters in her novels make difficult life decisions that are 
sometimes unpopular, such as refusing marriage, um, deciding deciding to have a career rather than to um, to get married. Um, um, other types of examples are community members who help to nurture some of the younger Black women characters. So she, so some of, especially in Trial and Triumph, then Annette not only is nurtured um, by you know a grandmother figure who who sometimes falls short, but Black women in the community nurture and mother um, mother the the Black girl character, and so and so different different ways in which Harper shows that nurturing and care um, and sometimes difficult life decisions happen um, within her novels and encouraging readers, I think, to kind of um, follow some of these models as well. Great. Um, thank you so much for this. I'm, I'm grieved that we're out of time. This has been so wonderful and illuminating. Um, I think, um, I hope I'm speaking for all my Victorianist colleagues that um, this conversation today has not only just, I think, utterly convinced, convinced me slash us of the importance of reading Harper, um, but also the importance of engaging with all of your work and your brilliance and the, the field that you're a part of, um, the necessity of making these connections so that we can really understand um, the, the 19th century in, in the broadest and most just way possible. So I just thank you so much for your generosity and time and energy in this conversation. I've learned so much. Um, I'm going to be um, calling in Renee at this point to to kind of wrap things up with a, a couple last last announcements. But thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you so much for just a, a wonderful panel. And you've made me want to do nothing but read Harper for the rest of the summer. Um, and just the the ways that you were talking, especially about the the generosity. Um, of the scholars that have preceded you and, and the generosity of, of people in the field. I, I, your own generosity has been very clearly on display in this conversation and it, um, it's absolutely been inspiring. Um, so I'm very much looking forward and I think we all are to continuing the conversation about Harper in tomorrow's session, which again, I will remind everybody is happening at 11.30 a.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time and 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, I also wanted to just say that we are we are so happy that this um, this week has been able to be open to the public um, and has been free and registration has been available to anybody who wants to be part of these conversations. And one of the ways that we're able to do that is with the support of the Friends of the Dickens Project, which is our fundraising body and a, a loving and supporting group of people. So I wanted to offer um, offer our huge thanks to the Friends of the Dickens Project for all of their support. And also to say that one of the, the ways that um, they support us is by, um, is by helping us get donations from, um, from people who, uh, who are excited about, um, about the kind of work we're doing. Um, so if you have the means or the ability to do that um, and would like to donate a little something to the Dickens Project, Tara Thomas has just posted a link in the chat. Um, that will allow you to do so. And in that vein, we're also hosting um, a kind of mini auction, a fundraising auction on Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, information about that is available. Tara just also posted a link to that in the chat. Um, and then a, a last thing, I don't know how many of you have, um, uh, have noticed that we are hosting a grand party to which everybody is invited, all capital letters on Thursday evening of this week. This is a Dickens universe tradition. It is full of cake and cheese and wine and conversation. Unfortunately, we can't all have the cake and cheese and wine together, but um, please join us for Thursday night for an evening of chat and you can bring your own glasses and cut yourself seven pieces of your own cake and, um, and we can come together for a conversation and, um, and talk about all of the amazing things that, that have been happening this week. So and so please join us for all of this and again a huge thank you to our panelists today for just a wonderful wonderful session thank you thank you thanks, thanks. everybody thank you so much uh, thank you